All right. Am I on? You hear me? We're good? Okay. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And um, what I'd like to talk a, a little bit about is, um, as Paul mentioned, um, I originally started out as a painter. I went to art school and studied painting. And for, you know, that was, that's pretty much what I did. I was always interested in a lot of other topics, but um, that's what I studied. And I was um, pretty active doing that. Um, when I, what I want to talk about is basically, what do you do after you graduate? And I don't really want to get, it's not, this is not going to be like a, a um, I'm not really necessarily giving anybody advice at all. I'm just going to kind of tell you a little bit about what my experience was um, over the last 10 years or so and just share my experiences with you. It's been a very, it's been, a, it's been kind of a crazy road. You end up in places where you wouldn't really expect, in jobs you wouldn't expect, um, but the trick is to kind of use all those different uh, paths that you sometimes accidentally ended up in and use that um, for what you're really trying to do in your own work and you know how to tie it all together. It's kind of a universal question that a lot of artists have to figure out. <laughs> and um, that's what I'd like to talk about. So like I said, I first, when I first I, I graduated, I studied painting. At that time, even when I was a senior, I was kind of thinking basically like, how am I really going to make money? And in my mind at that time, even at that time, I always, I never really planned, I never had a plan in my mind, okay, I'm going to sell X, X amount of paintings. I'm going to try to do it that way. I mean, when I was in college, we, we got a lot of advice. You know, this is how you market yourself. This is how you network and all this kind of stuff. But for me, I always just wanted to make my work and without the idea of selling it. If I was going to sell it, hey, there's nothing wrong with that. But to set that out as your plan in any kind of creative endeavor is kind of big trouble. It's kind of a lot of times you end up, you know, um, even subconsciously modifying your work a little bit. Is this sellable? Is that not? So in my mind, I just wanted to avoid that to begin with. So um, I started a house painting business, actually. Um, and right out of college, I basically was, I would paint houses, and especially out here in New Orleans, I see there's just so many, it looks like every house needs some kind of paint, painting. So what I would do is I would paint like 30 or 40 houses in, you know, three or four months. And then I would spend basically the rest, the rest of the seven, eight, nine months of the year kind of dedicated towards um, making artwork. And really it worked out great for a couple of years while I was doing that. Um, and the thing about, I know you guys talk about entrepreneurship and businesses and all that kind of stuff um, in maybe some of your studies, but the trick with it is to have a business that you don't have to invest a lot of money into. You know, you don't want to necessarily right out of the gate, you know, drop $10,000 on some, on some business plan, you know. So at that time, I had a couple hundred dollars. I didn't even have any ladders, vehicle, or <laughs> employees, but I knew how to, I painted for one summer before, and since I went to art school, I knew how to make a logo and make a, a make a, a nice looking company. At least half of it is what it looks like. So um, I went out and got some jobs without any of the equipment, like I said. <laughs> and um, I collected 10% deposit for, to paint your house a couple of months later. So like crazy, I you know, got about 10 or 15 customers and pulled that much money together and bought some ladders and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so I'm going to just kind of balance, I'm going to be talking about what I was doing for money at the time and also what kind of work I was making. So like I said, I did study painting, but right away I've always been interested in electronics and sound. And during, the, during that period after, um, after art school, I really didn't paint that much right away. I, I started just kind of messing around with um, different kind of sound sculptures and really it's just pure experimentation and just just, just having some fun, actually. So um, I would use a lot of found objects. You know, I would, a lot of times people are throwing out speakers, and uh, you can find all kinds of stuff. So what I was doing, I was kind of creating these uh, sonic environments. Um, so this was kind of like a multi, multi-track system. It looked kind of like a very, you know, uh, for lack of a better word, this is kind of a a kind of ghetto sculpture, basically. <laughs> Just all found materials, and the speakers, half of them were cracked. But I was kind of using, I was using that, um, that kind of sound to my, my advantage. So um, 
this one you would sit in this chair and be surrounded by uh, sounds, basically. Um, I don't have a recording of that, but these are some early, early works I was doing. Um, and I know this looks like very, very old equipment, but it, since it was all found, <laughs> this really wasn't 1975, but that's what I would find on the street, basically, all these amplifiers, and uh, I think I even found that monitor. So um, actually, you can see my, that's actually a painting I was doing at the same time, straight up ahead, and you can actually see my ladders <laughs> diagonally from the right, top right corner also in storage. So this is kind of a good shot of showing a little bit of everything I was doing at the moment. Um, around that time, I was also doing some collaborations with other artists. Uh, I was, again, I was kind of focusing in on these kind of sonic sculptures or, or so sonic environments. And actually, I made these two things on either side of my head here are speakers, actually. And those are just handmade speakers that I, that I just made from kind of found, found parts. And again, I was using this kind of, uh, Obviously, they weren't high-fidelity speakers, but they were functional, and they, they did give a, a certain character to the sound. And I did a collaboration with, with a video artist, and his work is on the screen in that, from that hanging uh, monitor. And basically, with this one, there really was no, no correlation necessarily between the video and the sound. Um, but people who sat there would always ask, you know, am I controlling the video with this? you know, these metal things on my head, or it had this kind of science, science fiction-y kind of feel to it. Um, but those were all, all those kind of impressions were imposed by the, the listener or the viewer, really, that couldn't really control any of that kind of stuff. So um, these are just close-ups of the speakers that I made, and this is just two pieces of steel and some ceramic magnets just stuck on the back with a very light material in between, and that's, how you make a ribbon speaker, basically. Um, oops, you know what? Actually, I had a sound. Let me just play a little clip. Uh, oops. Uh, obviously, that was with a it's kind of messing around with the radio and a synthesizer, and I, it was not Deep Purple, but <laughs> um, so that that period of time actually was when I was uh, pa painting houses for a living. Those two years after I graduated from uh, undergraduate school, so um, 
I really did have a lot of time because of my work schedule to kind of make a lot of these kind of projects. Uh, and I think that's something that you guys and just anybody who's trying to make some kind of creative work has to think about. I mean, for me at least, you know, I need kind of large segments of time, you know, a week, two weeks, a month to kind of, kind of even get into the mode of really, really being creative. Other people, you know, you guys have to know, know yourselves. Like, you know, can you come home from work at six, seven, eight o'clock at night and with a full-time job and um, do what, you're, what you want to do? Um, or maybe you can find something, maybe your day job is exactly what you want to do. And that's, that's obviously the ideal. Um, but you, you really, everyone has to really just put some thought into that and, you know, figure it out. Um, at least think about it. Uh, so, like I said, this is just my, my, own, my own path, which <laughs> I'm not sure I'll always recommend, but you might be able to learn just, you know, from different experiences I've had, pros and cons, I guess, ups and downs. So, um, actually, what I, so after, the, after this, um, like I said, that was about two years, and I really wanted to kind of keep, um, I wanted to study a little bit more and learn a little bit more. And since my background was in painting, and I just kind of ended up doing a lot of the sound and electronic stuff, um, I wanted to go, just to go a little bit further and learn from other people, basically. So um, I didn't want to go to another program and, and be in a fine arts program. So what I did is I applied to other programs that were kind of more ex experimental music, um, a lot of different programs, and I tried to find, tr tried to find one that would, um, you know, maybe it's something, it may be not that uh, typical or what you might expect, but, you know, if you, if you guys are going to look to go to, to grad school or something like that, you know, really, really open your horizons and see what's available. Um, schools you may not have, have even considered or all that kind of stuff. So I applied to Dartmouth College, which is a, a fantastic school, not really known for uh, art or music, really, but they had a pretty killer uh, computer music and electronics program up there. Um, and even though I didn't really have the qualifications that they were looking for, they were looking for either composers or people with um, electrical engineering degrees. And I didn't have either of those, but you know, I applied and Thankfully, they you know they let me in. It was it was fantastic. So um, that's the other thing. Like, don't really don't eliminate yourself from a possibility. You might even see a job applicate you know a, a posting or something, and you might say, hey, I don't have those qualifications. First of all, you have to ignore ignore whatever qualifications anyone's ever asking, and just just show up. <laughs> and you know, let's say 10% of the time it works. That could change. That could change your whole, you know, path. So that's what happened. So I, at Dartmouth, I, I kind of continued um, doing these large sculptures, and my focus there was electronics. But it was a very um, music-centric place. So I got to learn about music, which I really didn't know much about before, besides what I kind of, you know, learned on my own. So this is a this is a, a 20 foot long uh, piece of mylar, basically, and it, this is a giant giant speaker. Uh, they usually make, I got this, this material, they make gigantic blimps and stuff like that, or helium balloons out of it. Um, and here's another view from above. It's, this was a gallery where they had a little viewing space. Uh, and this is from behind. So it is wired. It has like some coils that I taped and kind of, uh, again, it has kind of a very, there's certain immediacy to kind of how I made it. It's just all, you know, scotch tape and wire and very, kind of primitive way it worked. Um, and actually, I'll just show you a, a video real quick of that. Um, sorry, I didn't have this uh, ready right here. Excuse the navigating here. Um, all right. Not the best quality, but it has some sound also. So it has this kind of shimmering effect, and I was also interested in the visual aspect to it. Kind of reflected light, almost like 
water a light off of, off of a lake or something like that. So um, all that sound was just emanating right from that, that um, speaker, that membrane. And um, at that time, uh, actually that the sound for that was uh, from uh, Ligeti's atmospheres actually. So that was one of the things I was, at Dartmouth I learned, was learning about music and I would you know, take scores maybe of classical music and um, basically pump them through, you know, devices like that and, um, you know, just see what, see what would happen. Um, Um, the other thing I'd, I'd like to say also about this kind of balancing, you know, work and art, artwork. Um, at that time, again, like I said, I was at Dartmouth, and the great thing about that school is they, all the graduate students pretty much had a, a free ride. Um, basically, you get a stipend and, you know, play, it was crazy, actually. I couldn't, it, I was a little bit shocked <laughs> about, you know, some of these schools that have a lot of money, they'll really, you know, support their graduate students. So. Um, that's another thing, if you guys are ever applying to schools, uh, sometimes, you know, some of these schools that aren't maybe known for art or music or anything like that, number one, they have a lot of money, <laughs> and number two, a lot of times their graduate programs are fully funded. And so if you get in, you know, it's, it's pretty awesome, because I didn't have to work for two years, so that was, that was really nice. Um, at that time, um, these, these other pieces, I was basically using CDs and different sources of material like that, playing, playing sounds from a source and um, into some kind of sculptural, you know, whatever. Um, but what I wanted to do and why, why I also went to Dartmouth is I wanted to build the electronics from, from scratch, basically. I wanted, the, I wanted that to be part of the, of the art, part of the, um, the design, part of the whole thing. So that was my goal when I, when I went to Dartmouth. And that's what I. That's what I started to do the second. My second year when I was there. Um, this is also kind of similar to the earlier pieces where I'm making these kind of sonic environments. Um, in this piece, I found this hospital gurney. It was a pretty creepy piece actually. This I just, at this antique store in Vermont, and it had such a strange character to it. Um, what I was trying to do here, I was kind of making almost like a, a still, like a movie scene. You kind of walk into a space. It's a sculptural kind of uh, piece in a way, but it's it's almost like a still scene. You know, you're in a you're in a very unique situation. You walk into a room. There's a light and a hospital gurney and these speakers. And you know, as the visitor, you can walk in. You can lay down on this gurney on this gurney, and it's three channels. And all the electronics are here in the uh, in the bedpan <laughs> below him. And I'll just play a little clip of this sounded like. <laughs>
So that was all, it's all basically from electronics in, the, in that bedpan over there. There was no recorded material. Uh, here's another clip. And actually, the music would continuously morph. You can turn it, you can have it on forever, basically. And over time, it would constantly be changing. Um, and I think I was kind of dealing with, you know, kind of like half sleeping, half dead, you know, kind of uh, about consciousness. And that's at least my impression when I, what I was thinking about a little bit. Um, and that's actually what was underneath that, that bedpan area. And um, what was also great about that time at, at Dartmouth was uh, some of the professors I had were just awesome. Um, at that time, I didn't have any electronics background at all, but like some of the professors there really kind of, even in the, in the electrical engineering department, um, really just kind of liked what we were doing in our program and really went the, the extra mile and would just almost one-on-one -on -one explain to me. Um, I would take a class and it would be over my head because I didn't have the proper background for the class. And you know, one particular professor would Explain, he would actually say, look, Andrew, anytime you have a question, just come into my office and I'll explain it to you. I'll show you, I'll, we'll talk about it. And um, that's what he did. He kind of tutored me in a way. And, um, you know, I owe a lot to that, to that professor for that. Um, this is just a, another shot in kind of daylight, I guess. And this is just one more clip of uh, what it, this is another kind of more active part of the sound, what it could sound like. Okay, so um, that was the last piece I made at Dartmouth, and to be honest with you, at that, right up until the day I was graduating, I didn't really have a second thought about what am I going to, you know, how am I going to make money or any of that kind of stuff. Um, I actually had a plan. There was an artist I was kind of fond of um, out in, in, I was thinking about maybe moving to uh, New Mexico at that time. I had a lot of different kinds of plans, and you know, just like in life, a lot of times things come up. You know, you have family issues or all kinds of different things happen. And it turns out I kind of felt like I missed that bus. Basically, that bus was, could have gotten on that bus, but I kind of missed it, basically, and ended up kind of going in a different direction. Um, I went, I actually spent a couple, couple months in, in Russia after that time. Um, I came back, came back home to what was Philadelphia and... Um, basically was pretty much broke. Um, you know, it's actually going to Russia in the winter with no money, it's gonna, it's, it's tough. <laughs> so I came back there for a couple months, I, and frankly, I didn't know what to do. I had no plan and no idea of what, and basically I spent a couple months on my friend's couch while I tried to figure out what exactly to do. So a lot of times you go back to what you know, right? So. Um, I started a house painting business again because I said, you know what, I need money now and I don't want to go work at you know, Walmart or whatever, so let me see if I can do this again. So um, I didn't really want to do it at that time, but it actually worked out okay. So, this, so again, I, had an, I actually had a partnership with a friend of mine and again, having a little bit of graphic design um, background, you can kind of just whip together a company and it looks like you've been together for 30 years, but meanwhile, been you know a week so um, 
I would do direct mail. I would go to the, there's places you can buy addresses and um, I think I sent something like 11,000 direct mail uh, pieces out. And I probably booked about three or four months of work just from that mailing. And from there, I was pretty, the next couple of years actually, I was pretty much busy doing that kind of work. Um, we did a lot of nice houses and all that kind of stuff. Um, we did this place on the outside of Philadelphia. Um, but the thing was, when I was doing painting before, it was nice because I was working only half a year and then I was, had a lot of time. But now I was working all the time. It just did not make, I wasn't, mean, I wasn't really making anything creative. I was just spending all my time painting houses, which was not really what I wanted to do. So I quit and um, actually, I'll get to what I was doing work-wise later, but um, I kind of went back to painting. Um, I didn't really know what, I didn't even know what kind of work I wanted to make or what I was making. So um, I ended up, I was doing these drawings basically where I actually was very influenced by, by music, by serial music. Um, this is a 10 foot, 10 foot tall drawing by about six and a half feet wide. And I kind of made rules for myself. What I did was, it was kind of a dice rolling game, basically. I, I, just, I said, you know what, I'm only, I don't, want, I don't know what to draw, but how about I, have, I limit myself to six different kinds of lines. You know, I can make a quarter of a circle, a straight line, up and down, and that kind of thing. Um, and I would roll the dice, basically, determining which, um, what kind of mark I was gonna make. And I ended up, the dice rolling was getting ridiculous, but I actually ended up, um, writing a little computer program that, that actually it didn't, it didn't print out what the drawing was gonna look like, but it actually, I was able to print out a score. So I would have here, for instance, draw a straight line, four units, and then go up two to start the next line. And so each, each thing was just very, um, very procedural, and um, I was just trying to get myself out of an artistic rut, I guess, in a way. And, um, what I also learned from this piece, though, is a lot of times I was in the middle of a drawing. Oh, well, I'm sorry, let me just back up for a second. So the rules were that I, I, I only can make six types of, of marks and certain size constraints and whatnot. And I also told myself I would only, I'd have to make 1,000 marks before I can change the plan that would generate those marks. So I couldn't like make 100 marks and then change my mind. I said I'm gonna make 1,000 marks and then I can make one adjustment to the algorithm, basically. And then I gotta do another thousand marks. I can't, in that thousand marks, I can't change. I'm gonna do, an, and then basically, so it was kind of like impulse control a little bit. You know, when you're making something, you're like, man, I hate this, I really wanna change it. Um, but I just told myself, no, I couldn't change it. So what was interesting though is the parts that I hated the most while I was making them, after, after I got through them, turned out to be the parts that I liked, I liked the most. And that kind of taught me a little something just about kind of, I don't know, just the development of a piece of music or piece of art. Like it just sometimes, you know, carry it through and see what happens, you know. Um, so that's what I was, that's what I was doing there. Um, let's see. Oh, what time, what time do I have until, what time do I have to, 5.50, okay. All right, so I quit house painting at that time because it wasn't really meeting my needs. I was working all the time. And I looked through the paper. I said, I'm just gonna try to find the dumbest job I can have for a little while. I don't wanna think. I don't really wanna work that hard. <laughs> um, so I answered an ad in the paper. It said, need, need someone to do point-to-point -point soldering. I was like, man, I can solder. <laughs> How hard can that be? So I answered the ad and it turned out to be a guy who was making exhibits for uh, children's museums and science museums. So a lot of these kind of exhibits these days, they're very interactive, you know, you push a button or it has some kind of element. So I started off soldering them and before you know it, I was kind of headlong into doing this kind of work. This is a piece, this is, this is actually in, in uh, Jordan, in Amman, Jordan actually. So I ended up working for this guy for a few months and then he's like, hey, do you want to go install all these exhibits in, in Jordan? Um, I said, all right. Sent me over, so he sent me over um, with 17 exhibits to install in Jordan. And he was a Jewish guy, and he told me his friends from Israel were gonna help come over and help me, meet me in Jordan, and they were gonna help me install them. But they didn't show up, 
So uh, it was me and 17 exhibits in Jordan. <laughs> um, so the, I was doing a lot of the electrical controls and all that kind of stuff. Um, I would write all the manuals for uh, all these mechanical and the electro electrical components. Um, and I would build all the um, electrical components. And that really came from all the stuff I learned uh, at Dartmouth, basically. Um, but I did have the feeling that this was a, a very large detour that I really didn't want to be on. But um, I continued doing it for a while uh, because I, I, needed, I needed to eat, basically. So, uh, oh, okay. So I was working for that guy. He ran out of work, long story short. And um, basically, I ended up quitting there. And again, I figured, you know what? I learned enough. I've been working here for six months. I met some, I met some good people. Why don't I just do this on my own? Can I do this on my own? I don't know. But you know what? It's 300 bucks for a set of business cards. And hey, I'm the owner of a company <laughs> called Custom Black Box. Um, and I will. Museum companies, I will, uh, if you need electrical components or whatnot, hire me and I'll make them for you. And actually, believe it or not, I got a couple of jobs doing that just right out of, right out of, the, right out of the gate. So um, I got a couple of jobs from the Franklin Institute, uh, which is a museum in Philadelphia, and they wanted someone to prototype some of their exhibits. So they didn't know if it would really work, but they wanted someone to test it out. You know? So they said, hey, you know, we're thinking we want to have an exhibit where we take water and we run electricity through it, and we generate hydrogen and oxygen from the water, and then we explode it um, and shoot a ball into the, into the museum. It's like, can you uh, do that for us? I said, yeah, sure, <laughs> why not? Um, so that seems a little, it was a little bit dangerous, I guess, but um, I had good ventilation in my bathroom, and uh, I set everything up, and, um, it seemed to work okay, actually. Um, I had some small problems here or there, but I did document it. And so basically the prototype was for the museum to, to send out to a, a larger company that would actually manufacture it. So I kind of would test it and say, hey, don't do this because you know, it'll blow things up and you know, burn things up and that kind of thing. So um, it was kind of an interesting gig, actually. Um, and this was, you know, these were some components for, for uh, getting the hydrogen and the oxygen out of the, the water. And I would build these boxes to um, control boxes for them. Um, so that was, the problem was I was in my apartment in Philadelphia. I didn't have any real tools um, to do that kind of stuff. And I mean, you can use your bathroom and your kitchen table for that kind of stuff for a little while, but it, it's just really not that, that that good. <laughs> it's not that great. So um, I, I applied to, I was looking for some other, some work like that from larger companies that do museum exhibits. Um, and that's what I ended up finding after a little while. But during that period, I was really kind of exploring, you know, I was in kind of a period of not knowing, really, you know, what kind of work do I want to be doing? How am I really going to make this work? How am I going to make money? It was a very kind of confusing period. Um, and the artwork I was making at that time, I was doing a lot of photography. This is, this is actually uh, on the street that I used to live in in Philadelphia. These were very large. They were about three foot by three foot prints um, with, with an old school a medium format camera that I got on eBay. I would do a lot of night photography. And I think my, the work kind of definitely reflected a little bit of period of, you know, uncertainty and, you know, um, just kind of figuring it out, you know. That's my the truck I used to have with the ladders on it. That's where I used to live with those those two windows lit up, um, and that's what I was doing at that at that time. Um, like I said, I was doing that stuff in my house, but it wasn't. It was actually I did I did okay. I made some money, um, but it didn't seem like that viable of a business. But again, since the business it, it had no overhead. I wasn't really risking that much. And that's what I would advise anybody to do. If you do start a business, like, you know, start a business that you can start, you can run out of your house. That doesn't require any, you know, if you mess, if it doesn't work, you're not, you know, in debt. So um, this is behind the CVS near my house at that time. Um, so I did end up getting a job, actually. It was a nine to five job. It was a project manager 
at a company that would manufacture these exhibits for museums. And this is at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Um, it's a whole ton of exhibits that we, they had a new gallery there. And basically it's all custom metal, custom wood, custom graphics. And I was basically like the project manager. I was kind of orchestrating the timing and the, the drawings and basically getting the whole thing built actually. And it was actually a really interesting job. Uh, it was way, way time consuming. I was spending you know, 60, 70, 80 hours a week and again, I felt like I was on a path to, to nowhere, really, because I didn't really want to be doing that exactly for the rest of my life. But um, it was interesting, and I did learn a lot. And it was, it was, it was cool, actually. Um, these are some bikes that basically, these, these are pretty cool, because um, there's three bikes. And if you've ever seen some of these arcade games, you can you know, race, your set, race your friend, you know, three people racing. Um, these were kind of cool because they would you put your age in there and it would actually adjust the gearing of the bikes automatically so that if a dad and a child were racing, you know, the dad wouldn't be leaving the kid in the dust, basically. They'd kind of be like comparable speeds. and They were pretty high tech. They were, they were kind of cool. Um, this was at the Thomas Edison National Historic Park. And this is actually where Thomas Edison, he had his workshop there. And at that location, actually, he invented the phonograph and did a lot of the work in the light bulb. And we, we built some exhibits for that place, actually. Some of the, these are some like kiosks and light bulbs, uh, light, uh, light boxes. Um, this is the visitor center there. And this was, a, this was a very cool project to be part of. You know, again, the hours were driving me nuts, but it was, you know, it was cool. It was really fun. Uh, these were some of Thomas Edison's original machines. Everything was still set up, his original machine shop. And uh, we were making like railings and graphics and that kind of thing. Um, but I think what's interesting is, you know, you might, in my case, I kind of ended up just taking these random jobs, kind of jumping around a little bit, and a lot of the time while I was doing those things, I was thinking, hey, does this relate to anything I really want to eventually be doing? And sometimes in the midst of it, I would say, not really. Um, but over time, it's funny when you look back, you say, hey, you know what, I actually needed that job to do what I'm doing now, creatively, in, in a weird way. And that's something to just be aware of and kind of just kind of going with the flow and kind of stepping back a little bit and seeing, you know, hey, what I'm doing, maybe it's not exactly what, I'm, what I want to be doing, but um, hey, maybe I still have some, some time to do my work. Uh, and also, um, you know, maybe I'm going to use this later. Maybe it's going to be really beneficial. So um, these are some. These are just some different exhibits. This was a light box that we kind of made in the Edison style. It was projecting up from below into a backlit graphic from the top there. Um, and that leads me to, kind of, oh, this, I'm sorry, there's one more. This was in Orange, Texas. This was a botanical gardens. Um, again, I managed the construction of all this, these um, exhibits. And again, it wasn't, you know, it was just, that one was really just, Fun. It was a really nice place. I learned a lot um, just about the ecology in that part of the country. Actually, it's not that um, different than here, actually. It's right over the border of, into Texas. But, um, and that leads to what I'm doing now, at least as far as uh, um, you know, day job, basically. So the 9 to 5 schedule was really sucking the life out of me. To, to, I can't really think of any other way to put it, but um, I couldn't do it any, anymore. And so I basically told my boss, I said, look, I can't, I can't work here as an employee anymore. Um, I'm going to be a subcontractor, basically, from now on. <laughs> um, if you want to hire me, I'm available. And I, was, I wanted to go back to doing some of the electronic and interactive stuff. And um, so basically, that's kind of what I've been doing since then. I've been doing the electronics, but I kind of have my own business doing that now. And the company I was working for, they, they actually do give me the most, most of the work that I, that I, um, that I have. It's, it's from that company. So that's another thing. Like sometimes you might be working a job and you're thinking, man, this sucks, this job. Uh, I, wanna, I need more money. I can't work the schedule. And a lot of times the tendency is, you know, well, that's, that's life. You're supposed to grind it out. You know, that is, that's total bullshit. So don't ever think that you have to do that. Um, actually, I was happen to, happened to be reading the USA Today. I was at the hotel the other day, and it was saying, like, 10 reasons not to quit your job. 
now. And they give, you know, like economy and uncertainty and all this kind of stuff. But that's just very bad advice, I think. Um, I'm not just going to tell you everybody just quit their jobs. But really, like, if you're not doing what you want to do, um, it's just really not a good situation. So, um, so this, was a, this is just an example. At the Franklin Institute, we did this exhibit um, where basically it's hard to see. But these are the drawings. The designer will give the drawings to us, and then we actually have to figure out how to make them in real life. Because the, the designer can just draw whatever he wants, um, but we actually have to make it. So the idea here is you have a key. It's on the bottom right corner, and the visitor touches that, and it's an electricity gallery. So they get a shock, actually. They get an, an actual electric shock from touching the key. Um, so this is kind of, after getting that drawing, we actually make a prototype and kind of figure out how to make it, actually. And, and what's interesting is I have, to, I have to really learn how to make it safe, how to, you know, they get almost a million people through that museum a year. Um, so again, it wasn't always something I was planning for, but even in my own work, I wanted, I had this idea a long time ago. I wanted to work with high, high voltage and kind of do kind of different kinds of experiments like that. But um, I never really knew how to do it exactly. You know, how do I make it safe? How do I not, you know, electrocute people and all that kind of stuff? And um, I really had to figure out how to not <laughs> electrocute people <laughs> because of the sheer volume of people that come through that ex that uh, that museum. So it's like basically you're in, you're kind of learning a lot, you know, which is which is great. Um, this is another exhibit, the static electricity exhibit. Again, it's really hard to see from this drawing, but what you do is you hold one hand on a, on a ball that has a high voltage. And then you touch these other objects, and electricity runs through you, and you excite these different objects. And again, I really wasn't exactly sure how to do that, but um, it was really a great thing because I learned how to do the to do that. And I, I actually wanted to do something like that in my own work for for some time. So um, they kind of paid me to to figure out how to do it. And although I'm not making work right now and getting paid like you know I'm selling a piece and living off that, but what's happening is People are paying me to figure out how to do things that I needed to know anyway how to do, or I wanted to know how to do. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's not always so clear cut. You know, how do you, it's not always, you know, how do I make money? How do I sell my art? How do I live? And all that kind of stuff. Sometimes it's a little bit more um, complex and kind of just, uh, you know, more interesting actually than being that straightforward. So um, this is our star model. She was. She was testing out the exhibits, and that's the ball you would put your hand on, and you would touch these other objects. Um, so, and this was actually, this is the generator that generates electricity. It's actually 75,000 volts, actually. And I had to figure out how to, because that's what you need to operate those, those exhibits. And what was cool is, yeah, I had to figure out how to do that, and how to make it safe, and it's just basically like a on-the-job training and I would say that's a really great, you know, if you're in a situation where you're constantly learning like that, like that's just a great situation to be in. Um, this is just another exhibit. And that's pretty much it. Um, the last slide here, actually, I wrote this a long time ago. I had to write a thesis back to when I was in graduate school. And um, it was about kind of the path to making a piece of uh, artwork. And, a lot of times you have an idea, I want to make this, I want to make this, I want to have this band, I want to make this song, I want to have this sound, I want to make this painting, whatever. Um, and a lot of times what you have in your mind, you know, the end result doesn't match that at all. And that's a good thing, actually. When it doesn't match, that means you're probably onto something. If it comes out exactly the way you had envisioned it, it's probably going to be pretty boring. At least that was my experience. So I, this is kind of a chart where I had, like, you know, at the beginning, I have this clarity of thought and intention. This is what it's going to look like. And then as you go through the piece, you enter into this zone of extreme uncertainty. <laughs> and sometimes you peek out over the, that, peak, that, that level where you're like, what, what the hell am I doing? And at that, at that, at that period, that, I think that's when the most interesting things happen. And then you kind of come back to, Sometimes you get a little head fake. You're like, oh, yeah, I know what I'm doing now. And then you're like, wait, I really don't. You're up there again. And then by the end, you know, maybe you have a piece of, a piece of work that you are satisfied with or a direction in you know, work-wise or how to balance everything. Um, maybe it starts to make sense towards the end. So that's, that's the chart. So 
um, that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, actually, the company I have now is an LLC. Um, and actually, it's really easy to do. Um, actually, I had an accountant do it, but it cost a couple hundred bucks, and I had, the, I had it done in less than a month. So, yeah. No, actually, it ran off like some just found uh, old amplifiers, like stereo amplifiers. Um, it could, I, well, you know what, that was a really not the best recording, but um, I was kind of playing with, you know, fidelity in a way, like, you know, even if this is a really messed up speaker, like, yeah, so I think that was kind of more of an aesthetic thing at that time, actually, but.